Good afternoon and good morning to our West Coast listeners. My name is Juan Thomas, chair of the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice section. I'm so honored today to have as my special guest, my good friend and buddy, Dan Cotter, who is the co-chair of our Fair and Impartial Courts Committee for our section. Dan is also a past president of the Chicago Bar Association, and he's also um, soon to be, at, or now is the president-elect of the National Conference of Bar Presidents, which will become president in the summer, late summer of 2024. Dan, so good to see you. Glad to have you as my guest today. Juan, thank you, and uh, congratulations on a great job uh, leading this section this year and all the other work you do and so many other uh, facets of the legal profession. So thank you for thank having me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Dan, you are all things Supreme Court, all things constitutional law. Um, you write a column for the Chicago Law Bulletin um, on a weekly basis. You've written a book that I have here called The Chief Justice that I've read. Um, I am so excited to talk to you, and I wish we had a lot more time than the time is allotted for us. But I want to start by just simply asking you, um, what is your kind of perspective or, or view about fair courts and partial courts in the state of our Supreme Court in particular, but the state of the judiciary today um, in the climate that we're living in? You know, we, we're in interesting times, I, I, I think, Juan. And, you know, one of the things that I inscribe every copy of the book uh, as I think you know, uh, with your inscribed copy, as an independent judiciary is essential to a free nation, in my view. And those words, you know, fair and impartial, I think the expectation is, is that everybody uh, comes into the justice system and Lady Justice has a blindfold on, uh, the scales are balanced, and that's the image we have. Uh, one of the things that I recently wrote uh, for Constituting America is a column about equal under law and that phrase uh, on the, the front doorway of the Supreme Court of the United States that you used to be able to enter through, but now there's uh, gates around it. It says equal justice under law. And again, it's this concept that regardless of wealth or race or religion or any other circumstances, uh, that when you go into the court systems, uh, uh, whether it's state or federal level, again, uh, you're going to get a, a, an equal shake and an equal opportunity uh, to resolve your grievances or presumptions of innocence and all the other stuff. And you know, one of the one of the things that uh, you know we can talk about probably forever is is whether, uh, from various constituents' perspective, whether the courts truly have been fair and impartial. Uh, we see a lot more. Uh, what seems to be political or political politicization of the courts in recent times uh, at some of the lower circuit courts of appeals. We see some of that and some of the language, even district court judges. We see it sometimes uh, in uh, courts uh, in the state level. Uh, we saw, uh, for example, in North Carolina, a Supreme Court shifted its balance and revisited the independent state legislature theory uh, you know, a year and a half, two years later. Um, and so there's a lot of open questions, I think. And if you ask, the, you know, the average individual that's in the justice system, whether it's fair and impartial, I think that would be an interesting question, Juan. Well, in your book, um, the Chief Justices, you mentioned that, and you say explicitly that the court has become politicized. And you tell a great history of the 17 men who have served as Chief Justice. We've never had a female Chief Justice been 17 men, Roberts, of course, being our current chief justice. And you put this book in, in a cultural context. You don't really write about their, 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 their decisions. You go beyond that. And you talk about where they grew up, how they grew up, their cultural background, and kind of the philosophy that they brought to the court. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that, because there's this, there's this sense that judges are supposed to be fair and impartial. But you kind of um, own the premise that judges come to the court with opinions, with thoughts, with a history that they just can't set aside or ignore. Could you speak to that? Sure. And, and you know, I think, you know, through, throughout the history of the 17 chiefs, 
you know, one of the things that I've mentioned at some point in the book is until 1918, uh, there was no uh, case where all uh, of one party's uh, appointees were in, in the majority and all the uh, other party were in the, in the minority. It was a tax case. And we didn't see that really a uh, whole lot until uh, much later. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think that I talk about, for example, is Roe v. Wade. People think that that was a liberal democratic decision, but it was actually a 7-2 decision with five Republican appointed uh, justices in the, in the majority and uh, one Republican appointed and one democratically appointed uh, justice in the minority. And so, um, you know, I think that I think that the perception today, you know, we just had we, we've had decisions uh, that ended at the at the end of June uh, in this current term. Again, that uh, the the most polarizing cases, the ones that affect uh, substantial rights or perceived rights, uh, came down to six three decisions, uh, including uh, three hundred three creative, um, and including the affirmative action cases. And so there, there is this concept or thought uh, that, uh, that the court is not necessarily uh, uh, fair and impartial, uh, but that, that, you know, again, they, they, these are people, they're human beings, they had careers, uh, many of them in government, but, the, you know, all the justices come to the court with a background and experience. And that's, uh, as you mentioned in my book, what I tried to convey and try to really focus on to say, you know, there's this mystery around the Supreme Court of the United States and, and the courts in general, right? People really don't pay attention to uh, courts at any level unless they're part of the part of the uh, process and, and, and the justice system. Uh, but these people bring their backgrounds, their sometimes politics, and sometimes long uh, standing views on various topics. And so uh, we see that in their opinions. And, you know, this, this uh, uh, term uh, for the court was one where you know a lot of the, the the pundits and the experts and people like Adam Feldman, who does a lot of statistical analysis and is very good at it, you know, they said that this court has not been as contentious. The the alignments were not those six three alignments we might expect uh, more. Uh, but the last several decisions that came out of the court, of course, looked like this split that we have. And again, it's hard for the public to grasp. Uh, that, that that this court and, and these people do bring these kind of pre-existing views and positions and just to, to argue uh, as they do in, in judicial confirmation hearings, uh, stare decisis or that they will just take things as they come is, is kind of, uh, as, as we see, uh, is not necessarily uh, the reality. And, and you wouldn't expect that, right? You know, just as uh, we're advocates for our clients, uh, these again, these people have views and they have you know backing and support, and and they they rise to the top, and are actually uh, nominated based in part on their views. So is that what's changed? I'm thinking about the 1954 decision, Brown v. Board, where the Warren Court issued a nine to zero um, decision, outlawing segregation. But now we live in a time where you have these perceived partisan splits. You know, even going back to 2000 with the, with the Bush v. Gore, the 5-4 decision there, you know, all five, quote, liberal justices, I'm sorry, conservatives were on one side, the four um, liberals were on the, on the, on the, on the, you know, on the, Gore, on the Gore side. What's changed in your mind um, from... 1954 till now, and of course I'm, I'm being a little simplistic in my analysis, but um, it's 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 become so partisan it, it, today. What's changed in your, in your in your view? I, I think the number one thing that's changed is the nomination process. I think okay. that's evolved. Uh, one, uh, if you look at uh, the the you know Fed Sox society, Federalist Society. Uh, on the Republican side, uh, ACS, the American Constitution Society, to to a smaller extent on the on the Democratic side, I think that there's lit that there have been litmus tests in terms of what they believe and their views, and people argue that that's not the case that these justices come to the table uh, without that. 
uh, but you you mentioned Brown versus Board of Education, and that's you know I, I write about it in the book. I've written about it otherwise. It, it's a, it's a remarkable study. I think of as much as 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 anything. It's it's a remarkable uh, challenge by Chief Justice Earl Warren, who just came on onto the court in 1953. Uh, the the court heard it uh, under Chief Justice Vincent. Chief Justice Vincent had a heart attack and passed away. Uh, Warren was promised the, the a seat, not the center seat, uh, by President Eisenhower, and so he goes to uh, D.C. and the first case they hear is Brown versus Board of Education reargued, and uh, the papers from Frankfurter and other justices at that time suggested that the decision was going to be five four, uh, potentially to uphold Plessy versus Ferguson, and. Chief Justice Earl Warren challenged each of those justices and said, you have to uh, admit then that Blacks are inferior, if that's going to be the decision that you decide. And uh, by his politicking and by his force of will, he convinced all nine to come unanimously, um, some from the Deep South that, you know, uh, were worried about that decision. Um, and, and so... I think I think what's changed is the nomination process, and it, it uh, you know the the Justice Clarence Thomas uh, nomination uh, we, we're, we're all familiar with that. Um, the uh, the thing about it is is that in 1991, people I don't think realized the court was actually eight to one uh, with Republican uh, nominated appointees on the on the court. Uh, but what was different then was we had. Uh, justices that were swing uh, voters, and I don't like the term swing because there, there's not a lot of swing in any of them, but you had Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, you had Justice Anthony Kennedy, and you had Justice uh, uh, Souter, and then you had uh, Justice John Paul Stevens, all mm -hmm. Republican appointees, uh, but on various issues, including uh, Roe v. Wade uh, and, and, and other decisions, uh, became more and more apparently to the left, although uh, Justice John Paul Stevens to his death argued he did not change, the court shifted to the right and he just became more uh, skewed to the left based on that. But I think I think that's the difference now is that again, from, from Thomas and Alito and Roberts, and, and now the, the current, the three that uh, uh, President Trump nominated, again, they're all not, not beholden to views, but Again, it's it's like like I mentioned to you earlier, a, a column my column for Monday in the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin uh, back in July uh, was about how the court is kind of like pro wrestling, and some of the stuff is loosely scripted, but on some of these issues we can see what the outcome is going to be, and again that kind of calls into question uh, this fair and impartial court. The other thing that's happening, Juan, and and that uh, you know some on the right have said it's just an attack on. Thomas and Alito, but there's been ProPublica and other sources uh, talking about those justices and other justices accepting gifts, uh, uh, private jets, hunting trips, Scalia went on them, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg got an award and, and donated it. They, they all go on these junkets in the summer. And, and again, it's this appearance, right, of, of uh, impropriety. They may be doing things perfectly legal, but they're not disclosing them. And it's just creating, I think, for the nation, kind of this different view. Then again, if you go back to 1954, uh, when you see Brown versus Board of Education and a 9-0 decision on an important topic. As you well know and remember last summer, uh, the summer of 22, the ABA adopted policy encouraging the Supreme Court to adopt ethics rules. Uh, they are still the only judicial body that is not um, under some type of judicial canon um, you and I are as lawyers, every lawyer in our home state of Illinois is and across the country. Um, and so we still are, so a lot of us are a bit puzzled by the reluctance of uh, these justices not to want to adopt or live under some type of code of ethics, because um, it would really help to bring credibility and integrity to the perception of the court, don't you think? I, I completely agree with you. And, uh, you know, there's pushback, there's questions about whether there's any power. And and to me, that's kind of a, a, a misnomer because as we know, uh, the Congress was set with setting kind of the parameters for the Supreme Court. 
from the Judiciary Act of 1789. And if you look at Marbury versus Madison, for example, the, the then Chief Justice uh, John Marshall kind of goes through that process and talks about what the what the court's powers are. Uh, they have the power of the purse for the for the court. Uh, in in 1801, they uh, the, the then that Congress they canceled the Supreme Court uh, for uh, a term. They changed the dates. And so why people think that there's no control. I mean, our system is one of three branches, right? That are supposed to be co-equal. This is what we learn in grade school, high school, civics. Right. They're co-equal right. and there's checks and balances. And it, and and what uh, Chief Justice John Roberts uh, in refusing to go before the Senate says it's never been done, which is again, not really the case. It seems like there's checks and balances for the executive branch. We see it all the time by the Supreme Court and, and by Congress. There's congressional checks and balances, right? There's veto power. And there's, again, the Supreme Court saying, no, the, the Congress got it wrong. But what the Supreme Court seems to be suggesting is, like you said, we don't need any kind of ethical code or anything, and we're doing just fine. And, uh, and uh, the, you know, again, I, I think all of this is, is part of the reason that we see a Supreme Court that when you look at the polling on some of these polls that, that take place, uh, every couple of months, uh, it's it's at 25 percent or so, and you know some will say, well, Congress is at 18 percent, but that that that's not a good thing when the highest court of the land that's interpreting statutes and the Constitution on a on a weekly basis with hard decisions, when some of the justices are coming forth and saying, I didn't understand the rules or hospitality was this, that they love history and tradition and and use that. Uh, when they want to uh, perhaps right. roll back rights. But it, in this, the history and tradition cannot be that, you know, just as John Marshall wasn't being carted around on a on a chariot, uh, you know, and being given wine and dine uh, tens of thousands of dollars equally in his salary every year. That's just not what's happening. So, Dan, what's the solution, you think? How do we move to a place of bringing... Um, not only by perception, but also by reality, fair and impartial courts, particularly on the federal level and maybe more specifically the Supreme Court. You know, it's a, it's a tough it's a tough road, I think. You know, the, uh, the President uh, Biden, after the uh, affirmative action cases, uh, talked about this is not a normal court. Uh, he did say that, you know, court expansion was a bad idea. And, and I agree with that for a lot of reasons. I think that's a slippery slope. I think that there are, you know, I, I, I think that uh, the Senate is serious. Uh, the House is probably not going to go along, but I do think that we need some serious kinds of reporting. There has to be some kind of penalty for uh, non-disclosures of these things. Um, and again, I don't know how that that looks. Um, I think that that also, you know, I think that you know one of the things that I I wrote a scholarly article about is that some of the things that are taking place, we have to consider uh, whether there's state solutions and whether there's the electorate that's mad enough and doing something about it uh, that uh, that we saw in light of Dobbs in various states. Um, but but I don't think there's an easy solution. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that I do think that happens with uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, and there's been some discussion of it. Again, there, there were a couple of decisions including the independent state legislature this past term, where Roberts wrote for the majority, Kavanaugh uh, concurred. Um, you know, the, the uh, thing again, if you go back to Earl Warren and a few other justices in the history, they, they, they somehow through power of their position because they don't have any other real position, uh, but, but power and force of their will and really convincing the court that this legacy is something that if they want to have a legacy, if they want to be uh, taken seriously, uh, that they need to uh, consider uh, some of the uh, issues and some of the some of the public data on affirmative action. I think the the polling was 65% of Americans said that that shouldn't be touched. Same on on the Dobbs decision uh, and other uh, things of these uh, matters. And and uh, again, not sure if if Roberts has the power to really try to rein in this court, but that's, um, you know, like, like I said, unfortunately, I don't know of any easy solutions to this, 
uh, but I think that we have to keep it in the spotlight and the microscope and really uh, let folks know that some of the things that at least are perceived uh, that, that this fair and impartial equal justice under law um, has taken kind of a hit in, in recent times. Well, Dan, I appreciate your scholarship and you being a leading voice um, on in this space. Uh, but you also have a podcast that you co-host, I, I understand. How do people find you? Again, your book, The Chief, Just, the Chief Justice. Please uh, buy this book. It's a great book by Dan Carter. Um, but how do people find you? How do people get to your podcast? Give us some of your social media. Social sure, media. sure. I'm, I'm uh, on LinkedIn, uh, whatever the thing is for profile slash Dan Cotter, uh, all one word. Uh, on uh, social media, on Twitter, I'm at SCOTUS Bios, S-C-O-T-U-S-B-I-O-S. And uh, those are probably the two places I, I post on, on LinkedIn regularly about the Supreme Court and my columns. And uh, those are probably the best places to find me. Right. Dan, thank you so much for being my guest and for being my friend. It's so good to see you. And thank you again for all that you do for our profession and keeping us educated on these important issues. Right back at you, Juan. Thank you for listening today. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.